Tricon Residential started trading today in the United States. This is a Canadian-based company and had been trading um, just in Canada. Now uh, is trading in both places. And uh, the company um, raising uh, money in its IPO here. And this company owns um, rental properties across the southern United States primarily. Um, joining us now is Gary Berman, who is the CEO of the company. Um, Gary? obviously on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange there uh, following the, the celebration of that listing. Um, so Gary, talk to me about the business right now. I mean, when you look at the residential business in the U.S., certainly from a sales perspective, we've seen a hot market. What have you been seeing from a rental perspective? I was just looking at your numbers. You guys continue to see revenue and income rise, even as we know that people were challenged by the, um, the, the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, this business is just booming. Uh, single family rental. Uh, we think this is the, the, you know, potentially the best new asset class uh, in real estate, both for investors and consumers. And it provides uh, an unbelievable opportunity uh, for, for consumers as well, who may be struggling in the pandemic with affordability. Our business is very much focused on the middle market. And as you said, on the Sun Belt, uh, people are challenged looking for housing during the pandemic and we provide what we think is a hotel-ready product and a maintenance-free lifestyle with affordable rent, and we think it's exactly what the market needs. And it's a real win, a real victory, we think both for the consumer or renter, and obviously our investors as well. So we're delighted to be here. Gary, in this uh, challenged COVID environment, uh, your, your customer, ba customer base is, you know, they are middle America. I mean, they are working class. Have you been able to push through price increases on your properties during the pandemic? We've been very thoughtful about that, and we're very empathetic with you know, what the workforce is going through this very difficult time. And so as a priority at the company, we have what we call self-governed or limited renewal increases. So our renewal increases during the pandemic have been anywhere from 0% to maybe 5% in an environment where we could probably be passing on renewal increases of 10 to 12%. So we're really trying to put ourselves in the shoes of our residents and really drive the, the best low turnover model we can. We don't want to force our residents out of, their, out of their homes. We want them to stay with us and really be long-term renters. And we think in the long term, that's the best thing for investors as well. Well, Gary, you guys were also subject to some regulatory um, limits in that way, weren't you, in terms of the U.S. government um, you know, uh, imposing that rent increase moratorium and also eviction moratorium. Um, I believe that is now done, although there was talk about extending it. So does that have any effect on your business and your ability to raise rents? It's had a small impact, but look, we've been complying with those moratoriums, right? And we've not wanted to push out any residents for non-payment of rent in our single family home business. We just, we've wanted to do the right thing. Um, we are carrying a little bit of artificially high bad debt, but it's really de minimis, I would say, in the context of our business. Our business is extremely healthy. That's being reflected in the overall numbers. And it's something I think we'll continue to work through as we get the benefit of rental assistance. And Gary, the, the prospectus noted that you want to double the amount of properties over the next three years. Where else are you going to expand? We're just going to focus on doubling single family rental. We right now we own about 25,000 single family homes throughout the Sun Belt. We want to double that to 50,000 homes over the next three years. And really at the end of the day, there's so much demand for what we're doing. It's a high class problem. To give you an example, we might have two or 300 homes available any given week and we're getting 6,000 calls a week uh, interested in leasing our homes. So we really need a lot more homes, a lot more product. This is something that millennials want. Um, again, we're providing them with a whole hotel ready product, a maintenance free lifestyle, and we just need a lot more product to service this insatiable demand. So Gary, I imagine when you get in these buildings, I imagine you are remodeling them, installing a lot of new smart home equipment. Have you seen challenges getting appliances, you name it, other materials to help retrofit these properties? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely in an inflationary environment, both in terms of wage, labor, and certainly we're having some su supply chain issues, but I wouldn't describe any of those issues as being insurmountable. It's not stopping us from running our business uh, and running it very profitably. In some cases, it just takes a little bit longer to maybe renovate a home. When we buy a vacant home, we do renovate it to a common standard. So we're typically buying homes at about 270, 280,000, putting in about 20 or $25,000 upfront to renovate that home to bring it up to a high common standard. And in some cases, it's taking a little bit longer, uh, but on the, on the whole, we're able to continue to run the business very profitably and efficiently. 
Gary, everywhere we look, we see talk about a housing shortage in terms of short supply, particularly of new construction. We see, as I mentioned earlier, um, higher prices also. So how difficult is it for you to expand your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a real challenge with the new home environment. It's very difficult to bring on new supply. And we're actually trying to be part of that solution. So we're also in a build to rent business as well, where we're helping to develop new communities and bring on single family rental product. Um, so it is something that the market really needs more supply. It is so supply constrained. And I think that'll be an ongoing challenge. Um, obviously that backdrop is good for our business. And, and to answer your question directly, we haven't had any issue buying homes. We continue to be able to buy roughly 2,000 homes per quarter, and we expect to do that you know, on a run rate basis for the next three years. All right, Gary, thanks for being with us. Gary Berman, Tricon Residential President and CEO. Appreciate you being with us this morning, and congrats on the listing. Let's uh, talk to Craig Irwin about all of this. Maybe not the Shiba Inu coin part of it. Roth Capital Partners Analyst uh, joining us to talk about this. Craig, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, the Tesla shareholder meeting does tend to be sort of a rubber stamp affair, right? Because shareholders seem to be broadly supportive of the company. But are you expecting anything out of today? Could we get a, a change in domicile announcement, for example? Yeah, you know, I think the move to Austin um, is, is a really important indicator of probable Austin-related news. Um, we most likely will see uh, a change in domicile or uh, first production off the uh, the Austin line, first deliveries. So there have been viewings in public, there have been sightings of pre-production vehicles as recently as um, five or six weeks ago. So I think I think there is good potential for some exciting news uh, in the city of Austin. Craig, what do you, how big do you think the Cybertruck will be? And do you think they'll actually start making this thing in early next year? You know, the Cybertruck's been pushed three times. I would not be surprised to see it pushed again. Um, and I think personally that the um, the design is too polarizing. Now, there are some people out there that love it. Um, I, I, just like I am a skeptic on Tesla overall, I'm, I'm definitely skeptic on the Cybertruck. I think there's some better options coming from uh, other big names out there, um, household names that you already mentioned, and then uh, you know, companies that might be doing IPOs right now and uh, other companies with, uh, you know, established businesses launching EVs uh, in the market today. So we'll see. I'm a skeptic. I don't expect Cybertruck to be all that big. So let's talk about your skepticism over Tesla more generally, right? Because I don't think anyone's buying Tesla right now just betting on the Cybertruck, right? Um, they're betting on just the company's general growth, which we have seen and the recent delivery numbers were impressive. Um, no. Where? What's the source of your? They weren't. They weren't impressive. Okay, tell me. So, 241,000. How can you not call that a phenomenal number? Tesla is an amazing company. They've done a spectacular job. I cannot say it more clearly. But I am a bear. I'm not saying short the stock. I believe um, that would be the wrong thing to do, because they have some very specific levers to pull. Uh, one is the uh, the launch into India. The other is the launch of a mini car. These are not in the plan. These are not well communicated out there. You know, I'm surprised we haven't seen formal recognition of this more broadly. You know, even even as much as a year ago. Um, look at Tesla and the valuation. It's more than basically the rest of the automotive industry combined. And you know, you look at some of the surveys out there. I saw one recently. 70% of chief investment officers would rather invest in companies like General Motors and Ford to play electric vehicles um, than uh, invest in Tesla. So, you know, I just think there's better opportunities elsewhere, better opportunities in small cap. Love Tesla, love what they've done, um, but, but hard to push it as something people should buy here. Craig, I just uh, almost spilled coffee on myself. I saw your price tag, a price target uh, across the screen, $150. How do you get from Tesla stock trading about 786 now to 150. What has to happen? So, you know, the biggest catalyst of the next couple of years is going to be the launch of the Apple car, um, you know, 2024. Um, but it's going to be kind of like the Porsche launch for, for the Taycan, right? You'll see them announce something, you know, probably in the 10, 20,000 range. Um, and then look to crush numbers the way, you know, the way Porsche does. Um, 
you know, the technology in that car I expect to also be amazing, bleeding edge technology, typical of Apple. Um, the market share erosion we're going to see from the, the abundant brands launching into this market is going to be a significant factor. And, you know, I think $150 level, something in that range is where Tesla would be fairly valued in comparison to the rest of the automotive industry today. Now, there's catalysts that have to land for us to get there. I'm not saying this is going to be tomorrow, but, you know, I really think uh, it's the best way to indicate people are better off investing elsewhere. So if we're thinking about an Apple car a few years down the road, I mean, should we think about 150 as more of a, three, a multi-year price target rather than in the next 12 months? Well, it kind of depends, right? Uh, is Apple going to go out there and actually give us a little bit more visibility? You know, I've been doing a little bit of work on that, trying to um, prod people, um, because I think it would be responsible on Apple's part, um, particularly um, considering the ramifications in the market. But, uh, you know, there, there are things that could bring 150 to fruition, absolutely, at Tesla. Um, the, 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 the story that they have an edge on battery prices obviously falls apart if you look at their, their external sourcing batteries and how much they buy outside versus make um, in, in the Gigafactory. Um, you know, these things, as these become evident, um, I think are key catalysts for, for people reallocating money elsewhere. And retail is really what drives valuation in the stock. Uh, when retail investors see other things really working, maybe working better than Tesla, I think we see the reallocation, and it could move out quite violently, just the way uh, the way that uh, retail moved in over the last 18 months. And Craig, if you are in fact one of those retail investors that have stayed long Tesla and been a supporter out there on social media, what have it, uh, should you be scared by what General Motors has announced this week in terms of EVs? But you look at what Mary Barr is doing, right? She, she's being very strategic. A good illustration of what, she, of what she's doing is, is available from the, the investment with EVgo and tripling their network. General Motors wants to be able to sell EVs everywhere in the United States, not just in California you know, and, and New York and Massachusetts. They want to sell EVs in every state. Um, they're looking to have charging um, in underserved regions where they expect to probably sell EVs. Um, they're laying the groundwork properly um, to, to, to be able to make this a material portion of their mix going forward. You know, there's several other discrete items we can point to, others that they're pointing to over, their, over the course of their analyst day. But uh, General Motors should not be underestimated. Um, it is an American icon. Um, Craig, finally, I wanted to ask you about something else um, that is a potential risk with Tesla that is perhaps not talked often enough about. And that is yep. the, the safety record of the car, um, both with some of the fires that we've seen and with the um, the autopilot, which is not really an autopilot, but that's a, you know that's a separate discussion maybe, or maybe that's part of this discussion. Um, how big a deal is that? Is it going to be a problem? I mean, investors seem to have mostly shrugged off those kinds of concerns. So it really depends on who you talk to, right? If you talk to someone that owns a Tesla, they absolutely love the autopilot. They love the full self-driving features. Uh, you know, I talk to, um, you know, a broad range of different people, right? If you talk to investors, they find the concept of optical illusion, which is really what's mostly behind these crashes, as extremely scary, right? That means that Tesla said, ah, you know what, shrug our shoulders, a level of accidents is acceptable. Um, that's not something you see as far as behavior out of the other automakers. Um, then when you talk to ADAS experts, um, people that are on the bleeding edge of technology in the, in the moder automated driving system market, the um, resolution available in the Tesla cameras, the hardware in the cars is inadequate to deliver the level four at any level of functionality that, that would have safety um, consistent with what we expect basically from the airline industry, uh, the most automated uh, transportation industry right now. You know, I personally find it highly problematic. It's going to come down to politics at, at the NHTSA, you know, board hearings and, and, and whether or not they want to uh, force something on Tesla. You, you don't want to destroy a company that's being so successful, but but there really does, in my view, need to be a tighter focus on, on, on safety for consumers. Craig Irwin, Roth Capital Partners Analyst. Appreciate the insight. Have a great rest of the week. Levi Strauss is out with better than expected quarterly sales and profits as people rebuild their closets for post-pandemic life. The company took the wraps off a new $200 million stock buyback plan and told analysts on a call last night 
they have the spike in cotton prices under control. Harmeet Singh is the CFO at Levi Strauss and joins us now. Harmeet, always nice to see you. I want to start off the beaten path here. Uh, earlier in the show, uh, I caught a lot of flack from my team here saying uh, that I, when I said that bell bottoms are back in style, high waist jeans back in style, wide leg jeans back in style. My question to you is, what are the top trending styles? What are people really buying this fall? Brian, thanks for having me. Um, good morning. Um, you know, casualization is here to stay. The denim cycle is gathering momentum. In fact, the denim category has grown faster than the apparel category over the last two quarters. We set the uh, trend by you know, launching our baggy loser fits. 50% of our bottoms now are baggy loser. Men are buying it, women are buying it. Um, high rises are really in, and uh, anything that people you know, um, look good in uh, is, is relevant, um, and um, we as a brand can offer that. And, um, and you know, the brand, has, brand is really hot. We have pricing power, we've taken pricing actions. We believe we can take actions to offset inflation, which is a buzzword uh, today. So we are clearly emerging from the pandemic, a stronger company. You know, that's something we had said. Financially, we're stronger. Structurally, you know, our business is more diverse and digital and operationally very agile because we are, we are facing the headwinds uh, on supply chain and, you know, demonstrating that it's a competitive advantage for us. Hi, I mean, it's Julie here. Um, definitely people feeling comfy in baggy clothing, whether it be jeans or whatever else these days. So I, I can understand why these things are, are, are popular. Um, give me a little more detail, if you could, around the price, possible price increases here. I mean, how much are your classic Levi's 501s going to set people back now and then six months or a year from now? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, Julie, it varies uh, across geographies. Uh, it uh, varies across channels. Um, you know, and brands like ours, which are market leaders, and offer relevant products that resonate with all of you, with the consumers um, of all demogra uh, demographics, actually um, and, uh, enable us to price where relevant. The way we think about pricing, we basically break it up into three buckets. You price for inflation, and we have the pricing piles I talked about. You price for in innovation, uh, and you know, great pr products, uh, baggier products that are in, in style, etc. And then you reduce markdowns. But having said all that, our products today offer great value to the consumer. Uh, and if you benchmark our price points versus uh, you know the competitive products, we still stand out as true value, value defined as the price at which we sell plus the quality of the product we offer. And so, you know, our view of the world is, uh, you know, we can lead those trends and we can continue to offer products that really resonate, especially as people gear up for what we think is a strong holiday season around the corner. Harmeet, I was thinking back this morning to when uh, your CEO, Chip Berg, started at Levi. That was in 2011. He came in at a time of a cotton price bubble. We are now seeing another cotton price bubble how is Levi different today compared to that other cotton price bubble? Yeah, you know, at that time, uh, as Jim Collins uh, said to us, we probably needed a, you know, a prayer meeting to decide whether we want to take pricing. The brand was not hot. Direct-to-consumer was not as strong. Um, and we didn't have a head-to-toe look. Today, if you go, go into a Levi store, you know, you can come out. Uh, you know, with a shirt, with, with a pair of uh, denim, with trucker jackets, which you love, Brian, etc. And we just, um, you know, uh, closed the acquisition of Beyond Yoga. So, you know, we're entering the active uh, segment. So it's clearly very, very different. Financially, you know, much stronger company. Um, you know, um, our balance sheet is really strong. You talked about the share repurchase program, et cetera. So I think we're in a very different spot. Um, you know, we, we're now market leaders uh, by a mile and can set trends and, our, you know, and uh, folks across all demographics, across all ages, uh, you know, love the brand. We are resonating with the millennials. We are resonating with the younger consumer, which is uh, something we hadn't done uh, in 2011 and years prior to that. So we are a very different spot. 
Um, and, um, you know, we believe uh, we have a competitive edge in a lot of areas and, you know, and that's what is making our performance uh, really strong. And we're emerging out of the uh, pandemic a much stronger company. Um, I know that uh, Saz is over there in his lotus position getting ready to ask you more about Beyond Yoga. But I did want to ask you more one more question about um, supply chain, because this is something that really stuck out to me this morning in analyst commentary that you guys manufacture across 24 countries and no one of those countries accounts for more than 20% of your product. Is, is that accurate? And if so, sort of what drives that? And is that um, a strategy that you expect to continue or even expand that diversification? Yeah, you know, uh, when we set up a global supply chain, uh, the strategy was that it's important not to put all our eggs in one basket. And that's why our supply chain is fairly diversified. You're right. We source from 24 countries. Not any country makes up uh, more than 20%. And Vietnam, which was in the news as an example, is less than 4%. When the tariff issue started with China, we were sourcing into the US about 8% of our needs from China is down to uh, 1%. So agility and being able to maneuver through headwinds is important. And Brian, to your previous question uh, on cotton pricing, uh, you know, cotton is a key commodity for us, but we've been able to lock in uh, the price of cotton for the first half of next year at very, very low single digit inflation, about a point higher than 21 for the first half. And we're negotiating uh, for the second half. And as I said, we have pricing power. We think we can offset inflationary pressures. Julie, to your question about agility, you know, everybody's familiar with the West Coast uh, congestion. Uh, you know, we were getting in about 35, 40 percent of our needs into the U.S. to the West Coast about uh, 12 to 18 months ago. We've been able to divert that and uh, into the uh, East Coast. And we now get in about 20 percent through the West Coast. So agility is is working and, a, and in action. And if you take quarter three, I think, um, you know, we probably didn't service about $10 million of, of demand, um, you know, and for a company that generated a billion five, that's really, really small. So that's where we feel we're in a real strong position as we step into a strong holiday season. There will be a, a, a Levi's, uh, you know, product under the Christmas tree if you want to buy it. Let the record show. I, I did Yahoo search uh, that Lotus pose, and I don't think I've been like that. I'm sorry, Julie. I just I don't think I could do that. Uh, but Harmeet, on the topic of yoga, you just closed uh, on a $400 million acquisition. How will that brand be integrated? Will I be able to walk into a Levi's, one of your new next gen stores, and I will see things from this brand? Yeah. So you know, our view is first, they're a wonderful brand. It's a company that's been around for you know a little over 15 years. It uh, it really started with consumer insight about offering activewear to women um, and, and driving inclusivity, body positivity, and you know, uh, diversity is really important. So our view is uh, it's a company that's been around, they've done a phenomenal job, where we can add value is build a brand, scale the brand around the world, and uh, do it in a, in a way that the brand is independent. So we're not uh, at this point, thinking that you could get uh, Beyond Yoga in a Levi store. Beyond Yoga will have their own uh, own stores. And, you know, as you think about growing the brand, I think uh, the areas of growth are they can build their own stores. They can scale internationally. They can get into men's and, um, and the like. So, you know, long runaway for growth. And we're really excited about the combination of the two businesses and especially the people. Uh, it's very rare in an acquisition that the entire team comes over. But in this case, 100% of the team came across and we we're uh, excited to be working with them and, uh, you know, meeting their aspirations and dreams. Well, hopefully by the time that men's line launches, I will be able to do that Lotus pose because clearly I'm just too rigid here. Uh, Harmeet Singh, the CFO at Levi Strauss, always good to see you. Have a great week.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. We have seen stocks rallying in this session today with the Dow up more than 500 points on the back of developments over in Washington. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying lawmakers have reached a deal to increase the debt ceiling in the short term and a vote could come as early as this afternoon. Let's bring in somebody who's right in the thick of things. We've got Indiana Senator Mike Braun joining us alongside our very own Jessica Smith in D.C. Senator, it's great to talk to you on a very busy day. Um, it feels like if we're talking about a short term fix here, this kind of amounts to kicking the can down the road again. Why go this well, route when you're going to have to revisit the discussion later the, in the year? It's been the way it's been the way we uh, do things since the time I've been here. Um, you got to imagine coming out of running a business where I was a CFO and CEO for most of those years over a span of 37. Uh, it is ridiculous the way the biggest business in the world, you got to remember our fiscal year ended six or seven days ago for what we're trying to do now. So we've got all year through a budget committee, which I'm on, which is almost a useless appendage of the federal government because we don't do regular order committee work where the money that we spend through these 12 appropriation bills uh, would get discussed by bringing in stakeholders that are actually going to be involved in maybe spending the money. That's the normal way that it works. I was a state legislator for three years in Indiana. We always got our budgets done on time. We always did it for less uh, than, in other words, we spent less than what we took in. Uh, imagine that happening here. That hasn't happened since the uh, 90s, I guess. And now we're shrugging off not only the process, not doing what everybody else would do, we built in trillion dollar deficits annually, mostly driven by things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all programs people generally like. And with the current spending spree, we're gonna be kicking that up to 1.5 trillion soon. We currently are the only reserve currency, basically. We've got super low interest rates, all of that, along with inflation at a higher rate, start to be built into the system that will create issues down the road. Nobody cares about that here because it's the moment in what they've got used to, which is basically dereliction of duty when you come from being on a school board, a state government, and especially running a business with the rigor of competition to boot. Hi, Senator Jessica Smith here. So are you going to support this short-term deal? No, um, I'm glad that they're doing it, at least to get us off dead center. But I'm one of just three or four senators here that until you have real reforms like a balanced budget amendment or statute, or the biggest thing we could do to improve how this place works is uh, put in term limits at the national level, you'd get people here that would know more about how to run a, go a government that's become so large. But uh, no, this is simply giving time for everybody that's been part of the system to figure out what we're going to do. Democrats are doubling down because never has there been proposed $6.5 trillion of new spending on top of the $4.5 that we do annually anyway, of which we only pay for 3.5. So this is a new place that we've come to. It'll either be 400 to $600 billion of new spending, largely borrowed to pay for it because a lot of these revenue overtures aren't gonna actually happen, nor would they get close to paying for all of it. That's the big question the American public's gotta sort out. Yes, we're kicking that down the road to give, I guess, some room to see how you uh, get it accomplished with not one reform being talked about in terms of how you'd fix it long-term. Senator, I guess I guess it's been the question too, right, for a long time in terms of how you fix uh, the deficit and the, and the debt picture here in the U.S. As you said, it's been a problem for a while. Uh, and kicking the can down the road in terms of the debt limit, you seem to be downplaying the downsides of the government shutdown that could happen if you don't kick the can down the road. Uh, I mean, why are you so optimistic that it's not going to be problematic if that does happen? That's because in business, uh, if you had uh, proper training somewhere along the line, uh, you put probability analysis to anything you do. You make those judgments. The government's not gonna shut down to where it would cause any type of cataclysmic 
uh, event to unfurl. And sooner or later, you want to avoid the government shutting down when we're 45 to 50 trillion in debt, when you're not going to have people lending you money or where interest rates go up from 1% to maybe four to four and a half percent historically, if not more. So that's mostly talk to scare folks into not trying to reform the system. The likelihood that that would occur is close to zero. Schumer knows it, McConnell knows it. They've both been here a long time. And I wanna be clear, we're in this pickle because of Republicans and Democrats. It's just that Democrats in 2021 with the Build Back Better, even not even considering that we spent 4 trillion above and beyond normal, a lot of that wasn't probably needed back to fight COVID, but there was the uncertainty of it in 2020. That had full unanimity, bipartisan support. There hasn't been one Republican vote for the rescue bill or the new stuff they're teeing up. So that's a big difference. The government is not going to default. Uh, there's a plan if that occurs that mm -hmm. uh, obligations like bonds and uh, Treasury bills get paid along with the interest. It just says you can't borrow any more money. And this short term tool allows you to keep it open until you figure it out. But it'll be figured out with no long term reforms and the fact that they now believe the people that run government here and it's mostly on both sides. But now it's accentuated by Democrats that believe in the government mm -hmm. as a growth business. Uh, we're getting into dangerous territory when you start piling on a trillion and a half new debt without shrugging your shoulders or thinking it's going to bother you year after year going forward. Uh, Senator, you just alluded to the fact that Republicans haven't been immune from this either. I think we've both established over the last several weeks that this is an issue that has happened under uh, a Republican administration as well as a Democratic one. The debt ceiling or uh, the debt limit was suspended three times under the Trump administration as well. And, and on that point, we heard from J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon yesterday saying that, you know, he thinks the debt ceiling, we should get rid of it altogether uh, because mm -hmm. there is this possibility of this type of negotiation, a potential government shutdown every few years. What do you think of that? And what's the argument against it? Well, I'd technically be for a no government shutdown bill, uh, <laughs> suspending a debt ceiling. Uh, Jamie wouldn't say that for his own business. Uh, I could tell you his board of directors would get rid of him. Uh, and the companies that have acted like the federal government, of course, companies don't have a printing press in the basement. Figuratively speaking, a treasury coin or a, especially the Fed, who owns about five trillion of some of the more recent uh, borrowing. But it is different with the federal government. We currently just simply aren't feeling all the pain that we will eventually from bad behavior. And Jamie Dimon knows, as CEO of a big bank, that none of the things we do here would work anywhere else. And unless he's wanting to say the federal government is a completely immune or different than other things that we know have to happen, live within your means, you might borrow a little bit in a bad year in an entity and even a state government occasionally does that generally for tangible assets but think about it coming out of world war ii uh, we've now eclipsed that we were savers and investors then we paid off the debt and built the interstate highway system now we're consumers and spenders and we're do it at the worst level an example here in the federal government and you shouldn't make the excuse that you can keep doing it uh, because you can. And I think there's a point where you got to draw the line. I think Jamie and others know that there will not be a, a default, uh, that something will happen like it always does before that would occur. That basically is condoning a broken system that I'm tired of making excuses for. Senator, there is some reporting that perhaps why Senator McConnell offered this, this deal, this short-term deal, was because of the growing calls to change filibuster rules for the debt limit. Is that something you're thinking about? Are you concerned about if both sides really dig in here, that Democrats will end up moving to change the filibuster? Senator McConnell is a traditionalist, and he's been here a good while. And I think if you do get rid of the filibuster, we become the House of Representatives. Uh, that is its own issue. Look how close we are to that occurring anyway. We've got two stubborn Democrats 
that don't want to do it. I think the American public will even get a dose of more craziness and government gone wild in a quicker uh, hard turn into a significant financial crisis or ditch. So I think that's important, but we're very close to that happening anyway. And Republicans, uh, for the time I've been here, need to not be the party of no, or I'm not interested on critical issues like health care. It's the biggest driver of our deficits through Medicare, and we defend health care as free market enterprise. It's like an unregulated utility, and Republicans have got, got to be better at when Obamacare came along, we had no answer with free market approaches to fixing health care. The climate discussion, we can't be wallflowers there either, or you'll get more government and the spending that comes along with it because people in the middle and the American public in general do not want a spendthrift party that'll spend money on anything like the Democrats. They don't want a party that'll do nothing on any of the issues of the day. Somehow we got to reconstitute politics to deliver better value to the American public. Indiana Senator Mike Braun, really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, great to have you on the show. And our thanks to our very own Jessica Smith. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Well, 16 million Americans, yes, 16 million learned to play the guitar over the last two years. That's at least according to a new study that was commissioned by guitar maker Fender. Now, according to that study, 62% said they picked up the guitar because of COVID. So many of us were stuck at home, pick up, picked up a new hobby. Um, the question is how much of that growth can actually be sustained now that things are opened up. Let's bring in Andy Mooney. He is the CEO of Fender Musical Instruments Corporation. We've also got Yahoo Finance's RT Swaminathan joining in on the conversation. Andy, uh, what's the outlook been like for you or what? how has the business changed over the last several months um, as a result of things opening up? We know about the explosive growth that you saw over the course of the height of the pandemic. How are things looking now? Well, bear in mind that the industry was enjoying healthy growth pre-pandemic, around about 10% growth. Um, the pandemic rapidly accelerated growth. We grew about 35% during the height of the pandemic, but uh, we're continuing to grow at that rate again this year. We'll have another record year um, uh, and expect... I don't, we don't expect the growth rate to continue in the 30% range, but we, we anticipate very healthy growth uh, in the future, even when whatever the new normal becomes. Andy, we've spoken before about the interest that many young women are starting to develop in picking up their guitar. So in this survey, was there anything that stood out to you about the American teens, especially female American teens? Well, the, the percentage of uh, women who are kind of picking up guitar for the first time um, hasn't, hasn't changed much. It's still very significant. It's about half of all new players uh, are women. They tend to gravitate towards an acoustic guitar uh, as their first guitar. The, the thing that really uh, kind of caught our attention in this study this time around was the the percentage of uh, Latino uh, population who are really adopting guitar uh, in droves, about nearly 40% of new guitar players are, are of Latin descent. Yeah, Andy, I guess I would fall under that category here. And when we're talking about people picking up the guitar, there's an equal amount who had a guitar and may have not gotten around to learning, which was me as well. And so I got <laughs> offers all the time. I listed it for sale, got offers basically every day in the pandemic for people trying to find acoustic guitars. Obviously, uh, you know, supply issues around COVID have impacted everybody. But have you seen that kind of get any easier? I mean, what are you seeing in terms of supply pressures now this far in? Yeah, we jokingly refer to it as whack-a-mole. There is, a, a, you know, a, a new challenge that seems to emerge every single day. Uh, and we have to be creative to find ways to navigate around it. Uh, as I mentioned, I think we're going to grow around about 35% this year. We believe minus supply chain challenges, we could have grown easily 50% this year. So still healthy growth, but uh, we're definitely facing supply chip challenges in terms of chip shortages for amplifiers uh, and raw material, COVID, COVID challenges, and most of all recently transportation challenges. Andy, I'm curious because of these supply challenges, you had a factory in Mexico. I know you have a factory in California. Are you planning to bring everything within the US? Um, just curious about that. 
No, I think we're expanding capacity in both our Corona and our instant artifactories. In the case of Corona, we're looking to actually double the capacity of that factory. And we've already significantly increased the capacity in uh, in Ensenada, a lot of the new players are coming in uh, kind of at the low end of the price point range, and it's just it's just simply impossible to make guitars in either of those two locations, uh, either in Mexico or or California at the types of price a lot of beginners uh, come into the market at. But what we found is that people come in at the low end, and gradually over time they kind of move up through the price hierarchy move from Southeast Asian guitars to, to Mexican guitars, and ultimately, uh, we hope, to Corona guitars and then even custom shop guitars within our Corona factory. So you're talking specifically about the price point, but we've heard so much about um, the impact that shipping delays, for example, have had on businesses. Um, some have had to pay additional uh, to get those shipments up and running. I mean, how has any of how's that affected Fender directly or or are you able to continue to meet the demand even with some of the constraints? We're able to meet um, demand at I think higher level than probably anybody in the industry, but we're not able to meet uh, the total demand that's out there. I, I, there's probably at least 15% of additional growth that we could have had this year had we been able to either get capacity or get the product here on time. Uh, we have had to take up prices already this year. We're probably going to take them up again in the spring of next year and possibly even again for a third time in the summer of next year, depending on how the cost uh, scenario plays out. Uh, so far, the consumer has been willing to pay the higher prices, um, and time will tell if that continues. In our case, people can find guitars anywhere from $200 or $100 in the case of acoustic you know, all the way up to uh, $2,000, $3,000 if they want to buy a custom shop guitar. There's, there's lots of price options within the range um, for people to come in at, at multiple multiple levels. Andy, uh, in the press release, I spied that you guys have, the foundation at least, has been working with school districts to provide music education. Uh, just curious a little bit about um, how has it been like working with school districts as many kids basically stuck at home during the pandemic? Uh, and if you're sort of looking to ramp that up. Well, we're on track to distribute 10,000 fretted instruments into the LAUSD system this year. Uh, it's a very unique program in that we ship the guitars to the home of the student and give them access to Fender Player online learning product free um, the teachers have been very, very supportive of it because, you know, involvement in any creative endeavor in music and arts is fundamentally good in terms of engagement for kids in both uh, learning overall. So um, we're very happy with the program. Uh, we're committed to it for the long run and would like to continue to expand it over time. It's great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. We just heard Jess talking about where things stand right now down in D.C., Senate leadership saying that they have reached a short-term extension. What do you think of that deal? Yeah, so I think it's reasonable. Uh, clearly, look, this is an economic crisis of the Democrats' own making. They've known for two years this was coming, never passed a budget, never lifted a finger to have bipartisan conversations. So our view is, look, they've, they've lit their economic house on fire. They've been waiting for the Republicans to put it out. But it seems to me what Leader McConnell has done is give them a hose, uh, buy them some time. But it, at the end of the day, one, it's important to lift the, the debt ceiling. And two, it's important. To, uh, in fact, it's an obligation of Democrats to do this. Representative, it's always good to see you. Uh, when we talk about the debt ceiling, before we dive deep into that, we have to talk about that $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, whether it's going to be $1.5 or 3.5, because if some of the tax increases go through, I think it's the uh, Joint Committee on Taxation put out analysis which shows all Americans are going to get hit with a bit of a higher tax bill. That is that getting yeah. lost in this discussion? Uh, it is. Uh, I think there's about four different ways within uh, the, at least the House Democrat Ways and Means bill that lower and middle income families get hit with tax hikes. Uh, certainly, what Joint Committee on Taxation, our official scorekeeper, says is that many low and middle income families will begin seeing tax increases 
next year. It will grow uh, even larger over time. Uh, there are, of course, tobacco and vaping uh, taxes, a number of taxes on small businesses that will certainly land on lower income and middle income uh, workers as well. I think that has gotten lost in this debate, but more and more people are starting to understand uh, this is all in there. The president is uh, is breaking his pledge here. Congressman, what do you think that this could potentially then do to the economic recovery? I guess, how significantly do you see this potentially slowing things down? Yeah, Sean, I, I believe this sabotages our economic recovery. No, no country has ever imposed uh, trillions of tax hikes, especially on local Main Street businesses, just as they're trying to work their way out of an economic crisis. In this case, an unprecedented uh, crisis. This will, no doubt, it will cost, we think, up to 3 million U.S. jobs, drive many of them overseas, uh, five devastating taxes on small businesses. That's going to slow the recovery along Main Street. And then, of course, there is uh, incentives for the jobless not to return to work, both within the child tax credit and the Obamacare subsidies. That's a real worry for businesses because looking to this jobs report tomorrow, you know, businesses large and small simply can't find the workers they need. It's slowing the recovery, but it's driving prices up, too. Uh, are there ways, though, to, to create incentives, whether by means testing or other ways, that the lowest income uh, folk in our society get some assistance so that they can have child care so that they can then go to work? Would that be a way to yeah. get some kind of resolution and compromise on this? Well, the good news is uh, Congress has already approved in a bipartisan way, you know, tens of billions of dollars in child care that have yet to be spent, that if we're done wisely at the state level, could address this without creating a new entitlement uh, on child care that, frankly, uh, we can't afford over time. Also, you've got to get the incentives right. When uh, the child tax credit, which Republicans created in 1997, both to help families with the cost of raising children, but also as an incentive to reconnect to work, this new approach is to do away with that uh, requirement to work or have earnings. It actually encourages more to stay out of the workforce. Uh, that is, again, we're not going to see the recovery. That's going to be really tough on our Main Street businesses. So I think they've got the incentives wrong economically and from our labor shortage as well. So we know that Congress uh, potentially will debate those issues. But back to the debt ceiling. Um, during the Trump administration, it was raised three times. What's different now? than when it was raised three times prior, and other administrations have raised it. Yeah. I mean, there's the argument say, that we're covering debt that we already accrued. Well, it is one, it's a fair question uh, that you just asked. I think the difference is, uh, first, uh, each time the Republican raised it, we started early in conversations with Democrats on how best to do it. Not that they always did. In 2018, Speaker Pelosi and 119 Democrats voted to shut down the government, default on debt, and delay uh, disaster relief. Uh, basically, they said, you, you have the House, the Senate, and the White House. It's your responsibility to do that. So we're seeing that uh, replayed here. Uh, but I also think the difference is there were discussions. I have urged uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen, who I think has the respect and credibility to come forward with the framework. Let's have a discussion not just about raising the debt ceiling, but how do we together tackle these huge mounds of national debt? Even more so, this is also raising the debt ceiling about more spending uh, over the next couple of years. And as you know, whether it's one and a half trillion or three and a half trillion, uh, a lot of damage can be done there. And Congressman, there's also been questions about why we even have a debt ceiling. We heard that from Jamie Dimon yesterday when he was talking with President Biden. He was saying we should get rid of the debt ceiling. We don't ha need to have this kind of brinkmanship every couple of, of years. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it is an uncomfortable vote for members of Congress, no question about it. I kind of like that uh, uncomfortableness. When you're continuing to drive up debt, don't have a game plan to getting back to either a balanced budget or living within your economic growth, uh, this has forced both parties uh, to have those conversations. I think, frankly, it's needed more than ever. Uh, my complaint is 
that Congress waits too late to address it. That's where I would, I could create some reforms requiring them to address this much sooner in the cycle.